Okay, welcome everybody uh, to uh, Merging Revolutionary War, Rev War Revelry. Uh, tonight, uh, we are being joined by author and historian Gene Prochnow, uh, who uh, many of you might actually be familiar with some of his writings. He actually uh, uh, writes for a journal of the American Revolution, um, and he's a uh, student and uh, uh, teacher on leadership. And uh, he has a, a really interesting book uh, that just came out last year uh, about uh, William Hunter, um, who was the uh, a son of a British soldier uh, who's going to go on and and uh, settle here in the United States of America and lives a, a pretty fascinating life. Um, but uh, uh, Gene was uh, a, a, an attendant on our uh, uh, recent uh, symposium of the uh, Revolutionary War in Alexandria, Virginia this past year and uh, started talking with him. And uh, he had this fascinating story of the discovery of, a, uh, of this journal um, and the story of the person that he found out about there. Um, and so, uh, you know, we were happy to, 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 to make connections with him and invite him on to come on here to, uh, uh, emerging revolutionary war, rev war revelry to talk about, uh, this journal, talk about William Hunter and talk about his new book that came out. Uh, so thank you, Gene, for uh, taking the time and joining our audience and telling us some about, uh, the research and telling us a little bit more about who William Hunter was, um, and, uh, what he did. Uh, but yeah, if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to tell folks uh, to kind of kick things off, uh, this story that you were telling me at the uh, symposium of, uh, of the discovery of, a, of an actual diary of somebody related to the Revolutionary War, which, you know, from a historian's uh, perspective is like uh, finding oil or gold. Or <laughs> it can be it can be rare to find an actual, you know, something that, that sheds a whole brand new light on, uh, on a, this period of American history. Uh, and right here in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., which is uh, pretty fascinating. So oh, that's uh, great. Yeah. Thank you, Gene, for coming on here. And yeah, let's hear a little bit more about this. OK, Mark. Well, thank you. And, and thanks to the Merging Revolutionary War group here. I think convening these conferences is so great to be able to rub shoulders with other scholars and uh, people interested in history. It's a wonderful uh, group to do that. And I, I think it's a great mission that you do is um, to help, you know, with researchers and scholars get together. Um, let me just uh, share my screen and I'm going to uh, answer your question here about the uh, the origin story of books. I mean, I, I do find that origin, you know, how books get started uh, is a very, uh, are, is very interesting. And in one word, this book got started by basically by serendipity. Um, as I mentioned to you in Alexandria, um, this book just kind of came out of the blue for, uh, for me. I, uh, um, you know, as happens, uh, you go to a, a Washington, D.C., um, uh, dinner party, and they they always set you next to someone you don't know. So you ask, you know, what do you do? And so uh, when my uh, dinner uh, companion uh, mentioned that, um, uh, asked me what I did, and I said I was a uh, historian of the American Revolution, she she said to me, uh, uh, boy, we have a, uh, a diary in our family um, heirlooms that, uh, that I think takes back to the revolution. Uh, we don't know that much about it. Would you like to look at it? And so I said, "Well, my gosh, I am definitely would like to look at it." So I, I, I kind of jumped at it, jumped at it, and here's what I found. Uh, this is the cover of the of the diary, uh, and it, as you can see, it's undecipherable the uh, the language there. So I thought, "Oh my gosh, what do I have here?" So then, then I open up the uh, uh, the the document, and the first several it's obvious that the first several pages are missing in the document. Um, then I looked for the author's name and couldn't find the author. And so I asked the, the descendants and the uh, owner of the diary, um, did they know who it was? And, and they didn't. Um, however, what I found was, is that as I opened up and looked at it, the, 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 uh, the document looked authentic and looked like a real piece of history. And so that intrigued me and puzzled me. And so I decided Maybe I can unravel the puzzle to find out who this, who is the author of this journal and how does that fit into the Revolutionary War history? Uh, here's a page from the, the document. Uh, it's a 35 page document. And as you can see, it's a beautiful uh, 18th century handwriting. 
Uh, you know, people back then took pride in their cursive handwriting. <laughs> I don't know about you, Mark, but I, I, I can't write like this today. I don't think many people can write like this uh, today anymore. I can type on the computer, but that's about it. But what I found in the journal is um, it, it was clearly was written by a, 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 a child, uh, and it was written as a man about his childhood experiences. Uh, it was also clear that his father was a sergeant. Um, and is a sergeant in the 26th Regiment of Foot, so British Army. Um, and that sergeant was born in Lisburn, Ireland. So not Lisbon, Portugal, but Lisburn, Ireland. Uh, I believe he was Scotch Irish. He was Protest, uh, Protestant or a uh, Presbyterian. Uh, and he and his wife, um, Margaret, Margaret, I know her last name was, her maiden name was Nance. Um, they came to the colonies prior to the revolution. Uh, that's clear in the, in the diary. And he participated in many battles. Um, after the war, he was discharged uh, and received a pension from the British government. Uh, so what I would, to try to find out who this person was, um, I enlisted the help of uh, Don Hagist, who many people here know. And we went through the muster rolls of all the sergeants in the 26th Regiment of Foot. And so everyone, and we looked at the ones that had their um, wives and children with them on a uh, campaign here in America, uh, ones that survived the war, ones that actually received a pension. And we identified a, a sergeant by the name of John Hunter as a potential uh, 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 sergeant in, that's depicted in the diary. And um, so then we looked at, I looked at, at the end of the diary, um, the author of the diary became a printer and came, and came back to Philadelphia in 1793. And that's at the end of the diary. So I looked at Philadelphia printers and identified a list of Philadelphia printers that had the name of Hunter and uh, identified a printer by name of William Hunter. Uh, he, his, he, his, the first book he printed in Philadelphia was actually a Spanish grammar um, book to help teach uh, English speakers uh, Spanish, the Spanish language. Um, so, which uh, um, the only way to learn Spanish in the Americas at that time, they didn't teach it at, at colleges, was through uh, 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 through books or through an, uh, a native speaker. So, anyway, uh, so we looked at William Hunter, uh, and then I what I did is I did some genealogy that went from William Hunter in um, in, the, in the 18th century to the descendants today. So I went through that whole genealogy tree and I could trace now the the the, uh, the people, uh, the lineage from William Hunter to the current owners of the diary today. Oh, really? And then the third thing I did was I found documents written by William Hunter and they have the same handwriting as in the journal. So I'm a thousand percent sure that uh, William Hunter is the uh, author of this uh, a diary. Um, and then it, it is a, um, I should say it is a journal. It's written as a, a, as a older uh, man with his childhood experiences. And it's, it's definitely authentic because there's just enough errors in this thing to be true. So like, the, like, the, like he says, uh, uh, William Hunter says that his father was in the Grenadier Company. Uh, he, he wasn't. He was in just a regular uh, a, a company. He wasn't a grenadier, but that's probably a, a childhood embellishment because he was proud of his father's service. And he, later on, I've discovered he had a lot of pride in his father's service. Uh, there's a couple other embellishments. He said he uh, uh, witnessed the capture of um, uh, Ethan Allen um, by the uh, British outside of Montreal. It's not likely you'd find a, a 10 year old boy wandering the woods, you know, about five miles from the city center of Montreal uh, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a battle between the uh, British and the, and the Americans. So he, he may have seen Brit, uh, Ethan Allen uh, walk in the streets as a captive, but not likely in the battle. So those are the kind of things that, that were wrong in the diary, but it's amazing how accurate it is. And so it, it, it's, it's really, uh, you know, he didn't have the internet to check fact check. He, you know, he just had a pretty good memory uh, to fact check. So, uh, so the journal is definitely authentic and it's, and it's definitely William Hunter. Um, William, uh, 
Wayman's father was stationed in uh, uh, New Brunswick. He came over from uh, Cork. Uh, he uh, sailed from the same harbor that uh, was the last uh, with seven other ships here. Uh, they uh, sailed in convoy to New York and then by lighter to New Brunswick. Uh, and he was on garrison duty in New Jersey. Um, John Hunter and his wife, Margaret, um, had a child that brought with them uh, a, a, a namesake of John. Uh, and then William was born in 1768. Uh, John died sometime around the time that William was born. So he never really had a recollection of William, but it's the first of many uh, uh, tragedies you'll find in the uh, in William's life here. Um, and uh, so he, he never really had much of a chance to look to meet his older uh, sibling. Uh, however, uh, being stationed in, in Brunswick, New Jersey was pretty good. Um, there were reports between of the garrison and the town residents getting along pretty well. They went to parties and feasts and 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 dinners, and um, it was a relatively peaceful existence. Uh, and that's in stark contrast to what was going on at this time in in Boston with the Boston Massacre, um, and um, and as the uh, contention between the British soldiers in New York and the residents accelerated. They, uh, the British actually moved the 26th Regiment from New Brunswick to New York to try to calm down the local population because they were viewed as being very, um, uh, very good at that. So they spent some time in New York. Uh, William uh, describes uh, New York as a, a very pleasant, regular place, but as a country place. And so later on in his life, he'll describe it more as, as a city, but as a country place. So from New York, though, um, uh, William, uh, uh, is, his father is transferred to Montreal. And uh, um, I, the, by getting there, he went up the Hudson River in a sailboat, which is the fastest way uh, to get uh, from New York to, to Montreal. And um, uh, he tells us a kind of a gut-wrenching story uh, uh, during that transit, um, he uh, you watch, witnesses a, a man holding a uh, an infant uh, on the side of the ship, and as you know, infants sometimes squirm and they some and they 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 get fidgety. Well, unfortunately, this infant in, infant uh, uh, squirmed so much that he fell in the water, and so the father um, jumped overboard to try to save the infant. And uh, what was really unfortunate, and uh, it just seared in, in William's brain, is that the uh, a passing canoe um, rescued the child, but not the father. So that's the first time of many times now that William will, will uh, experience witnessing uh, death. But he made it uh, uh, to, to Montreal, and uh, uh, he had has fond memories of Montreal. Uh, again, it's another peaceful garrison, uh, you know, pre-revolution peaceful garrison. There was good relationship between the French Canadians and the, uh, and the British soldiers. Uh, William first went to school there. Uh, he went to an English school. Uh, he didn't necessarily he didn't learn French, but uh, um, much of his chagrin later in life, he, he'll he'll regret that a bit. Um, and as the 1770s went on. A part of the 26th Regiment of Foot actually um, transferred to the uh, Ticonderoga. And the picture on the right here is a soldier at Ticonderoga in a 26th Regiment of Foot uniform. And uh, at the uh, outbreak of the war, that group was, uh, that regiment was, was garrisoning that. Um, however, uh, William's father was still in Montreal at the at the at the uh, at the when at the beginning of the of the revolution. Um, so he um, um, when the revolution started, um, the uh, British commanders sent the, the 26th Regiment of Foot outside of Montreal to the uh, to the nearest town to the New York State border or New York the colonial border of New York. And that's at, at, at St. John or St. Jean in French, um, um, uh, Quebec. And um, uh, they garrisoned this fort here to protect uh, uh, Quebec from attack by the Americans. Um, this fort uh, is changed a bit by the time it, uh, the, of the revolution. Uh, when William Hunter's father was there, it had a stockade around uh, the, those those two uh, 
um, structures on either side of the uh, um, uh, center aisle there. And, um, and they had a, several redoubts with cannons um, there uh, to protect the fort. So it was a, a, a sturdier um, a fortification than it was shown here. Um, however, um, in um, September and October, uh, the Americans began assaulting this uh, fort uh, and under, using siege tactics. Tactics, and uh, unfortunately, William's father, John Hunter, was grievously wounded uh, uh, when a powder keg uh, uh, exploded um, as a result of a, a rebel shell, and he was burned pretty good. He was so he was really out of action for the rest of the siege. Um, and so um, eventually the fort ran out of ammunition, ran out of food, and had to surrender. They surrendered to Richard Montgomery. Um, what's interesting back then, though, is that you know, the Americans were going to send the British soldiers down into New England to captivity. But what's interesting back then is they sent to Montreal for the wives and children to accompany the men down to in captivity. So, I mean, you would you would never think about doing that today, but uh, 63 wives and over 200 children uh, uh, went into captivity with uh, uh, with those soldiers. Um, most of the soldiers marched south into New England, uh, but William Hunter's father, Sergeant Hunter, was too um, injured to travel, so he could not endure that journey. So the um, the British. Uh, so the, those soldiers, the British soldiers that couldn't travel, were sent to Fort Chambly, which is about eight miles from um, uh, Fort St. John uh, here. Um, and it's this, it's this, these pictures of the, of the stone and masonry fort today, I guarantee you, it didn't look like that back then. Uh, it was because it, it, it was also assaulted with cannon. And um, so it was not clearly in this great condition that it is uh, today, but it was a whole lot better than in being in that um, uh, Fort St. Um, John uh, here. So uh, they were definitely warmer there and more sheltered from the Canadian winter uh, in this fort. Um, uh, William in his journal uh, described several stories uh, that he heard from the soldiers. And one that really is, I think, most interesting is that uh, um, after the failed assault on um, uh, New Year's Eve by the Americans at Quebec, um, as, as we all know, uh, Richard Montgomery died in that assault, and the soldiers of the 26th Regiment actually mourned his death to show you that you know what that was kind of like. It was it really was a civil war kind of thing, but they had some they they had a lot of respect for the other side, and because uh, Montgomery was a, a a former soldier in the British Army, and some people knew him, and they they had a lot of respect for him. So. Uh, that's, you know, that's an interesting story. So they spent the, the most of the winter there, uh, but in the springtime um, in March, uh, William Hunter's father recovered enough, and I guess enough of the other people recovered, that they could travel to the POW camp. So um, under strong guard, the um, uh, William Hunter and his, his father and, and mother and uh, Travel down, uh, uh, really it's up the Lake Champlain because it's going south, it's going up the lake in that area because it flows north. Um, and so up Lake Champlain. And what they did was the lake back then was frozen uh, because a lot colder back then than it is today. And they traveled on sleighs. But in March, they um, it, the, the ice started to melt in some places and it was came uh, uh, it became rotten and there were some open spots. So they'd actually place logs over the open spots to take the, the uh, sleigh over the open spots, if you can believe that. And then sometimes the horses fell in and the, um, uh, the drivers had to cut the reins and then fish the horses out. And uh, it was a pretty harrowing journey journey to, to do that. Uh, but uh, William did make it. They made it down to uh, Ticonderoga uh, and then over to uh, uh, Saratoga. Uh, and then again by boat from there down to um, New York City. At that time, um, in uh, um, March of 1776, New York City was under the control of the Continental Army. And <laughs> believe it or not, as a young boy, what do you what do you um, what do you remember? What he remembers is the the, the brilliant or the the the, the buff blue. Um, 
uh, uh, uniforms of the Continental Army officers and how impressed he was. He was dazzled by them, uh, as you might expect a young boy to be, right? And so uh, he remarked on that. I don't know. I've read a lot on the revolution. I've never heard anybody think the the, the American uniform, uniforms were all that great. So I don't know, uh, but uh, he did. I guess that was the beginning of the war. But uh, uh, I'm sure that his father's uniform and the other people's uniform after spending uh, all that time in captivity and, uh, and in um, harsh conditions probably <laughs> didn't look very good. So anyway, so he, he traveled from uh, New York City across New Jersey out to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is uh, back then it was almost on the frontier, um, uh, Lancaster, but they had barracks out there that were built for the French and Indian War. And so that's where he was going to. Um, this is uh, a Picture on the left is uh, is the streets in, in Lancaster, showing the barracks there, um, in the center, bottom center of that. Um, as you can see, the barracks they put a, a stockade around the barracks uh, and guards to keep the soldiers inside that, and so they were they were guarded um, uh, pretty closely there. Um, William and his mother could go out into the streets, but his father couldn't. So it's kind of interesting. And uh, so, you know, it's possible his mother worked, you know, that uh, some people worked um, uh, and uh, so some of the wives worked for extra money, you know, doing seamstress and other kinds of uh, washing, all, all, all different kinds of domestic chores. Um, probably one of the most interesting things that happened to William during this time frame is that uh, the Americans let the, um, uh, British soldiers uh, inoculate themselves for small park, smallpox, uh, which uh, which is pretty amazing. And the regimental uh, surgeon and the doctor for uh, the 26th Regiment of Foot is named William Beaumont. And he was an expert on the Suton Suttonian method of inoculation, which was a uh, patented method. Uh, it's it's got it's got some witchcraft associated with it, but it's it's basically was better than uh, lots of the other ways of doing um, smallpox inoculation back then. Um, I know about witchcraft. That's probably the wrong way to say it. it. It had some 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 things around it that probably wouldn't help. But the the actual uh, inoculation process of, of of scraping a little pus into the, an open wound actually worked out really well in the way he did it. And so William was inoculated and he got a very mild case. And as such as being a boy having a mild case, he was an outstanding carrier to take to other locations to inoculate. So he traveled to other POW camps in the region and other uh, uh, people that wanted to get inoculated. Um, and, um, and so the doctor probably got paid a, a couple dollars for each inoculation. And uh, William probably got a little of that money to bring back to his family uh, for, for, for being the, um, the carrier of that uh, disease. So pretty interesting here. Uh, now, not everybody was fortunate like William and uh, the, um, there were uh, British soldiers that passed as well as Brit American guards that passed because of disease um, uh, in the camp. And uh, on the right-hand side here is a picture, is a memorial, a joint memorial between the uh, Americans and the British um, uh, on the people that lost their lives uh, in, in this POW camp. So, um, so William and his father and mother spent uh, a year in this camp. And probably it went in this camp, he had a younger brother that was, uh, th that was born in this camp. So, you know, things just kind of went on, um, you know, in these things. So people went on with their lives, even though they were in captivity. But after a year, uh, the uh, Americans and the British affected a POW exchange. And uh, the 26th Regiment of Foot was uh, sent through New Jersey uh, back to New York. Um, this actually is when his life actually deteriorated a lot. I mean, this is a picture of the fire, great fire of New York. And I put this in here to show that, you know, a good part of New York was burned out and where they had, you know, um, secure, safe lodging in Lancaster and in Fort Chambly. Here they did not. They, they, uh, they suffered from lack of barracks. They, the home, they, they were either crowded in barracks or crowded in homes. They also created these dugouts. And it was a pretty tough situation uh, with a, a very tight quarters. It was cold. They didn't have enough firewood. 
and they had reduced rations. Um, so, you know, we think of the deprivations of the Continental Army. Well, the British Army also suffered from their deprivations, also due to the lack of things. And this led to his um, younger brother catching a, a deathly illness, and his brother died in front of him. So that also shook him, really shook him up as a uh, person. And he died at the same time that his mother gave birth to a daughter. And so he had these feelings of how do you, which one do you take care of? And how do you take care of? How do you share short provisions? You know, how do you, how do you keep people warm? It was, it was a tough situation. So this is another situation where he had faced um, some pretty big adversity. Um, and also during this time, he had to worry about his father. It was a highly kinetic time. His father went on several raids, went on several foraging expeditions. Uh, it was a deadly time, and there was a lot of activity going on at this time. So he would watch his father go off to war, and when he came back, he, he was looking for his father. So it was a, a pretty deadly time. Uh, probably the, the biggest battle here that his father participated in is the um, um, Hudson H Highlands campaign of 1777. Um, as you, you know from your history, from history, uh, um, General Gates had basically surrounded um, uh, Burgoyne at Saratoga, uh, the, and uh, uh, Sir Henry Clinton uh, led an expedition of 3,000 men up the Hudson River to try to relieve the uh, 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 Burgoyne uh, here and to break the uh, break the American lines. Uh, to do so, they had to pass two American forts, um, Fort Montgomery and Fort Clinton. Now, it has nothing to do with that Clinton. That's, there's, that's one thing about the revolution. There's a lot of Clintons. This is named after George Clinton, the governor of New York, who actually was in this battle, by the way. And uh, that these forts um, straddle the Penopen uh, Creek, uh, here you get the uh, and the the uh, Fort Clinton. This is a view from Fort Montgomery. Uh, there's two 24 pounders right next to me when I took this picture, and the Fort Clinton is. A, if you can imagine that being at the end of the bridge on the right hand side, um, and uh, so it, it's a prominent point. It, it would command the those forts commanded the uh, river. The British couldn't get the ships up the river without uh, passing this fort, destroying this fort. Uh, which they did. They uh, they ended up um, faking out uh, Israel Putnam, going inland and uh, around to the back of these forts. And uh, uh, William's father uh, was part of the assault force on Fort Clinton. And that was a just a, a hard, hard assault because they had to go over a well-defended, uh, they had to go over open ground against a well-defended redoubt. Uh, here that was, uh, and so there was a lot of casualties on the, most of the British casualties uh, were at Fort Clinton. Fort Montgomery wasn't completely finished at the time. And so the casualties were lighter there and they were less defended from the uh, landward side. So um, John Hunter was uh, in the bloodiest part of the battle. And um, uh, the uh, Burgoyne ended up surrendering before Clinton could go much further, and therefore he just kind of went back down to New York. And there's just a gut wrenching uh, story uh, that William puts in his journal about um, uh, uh, watching for the wagons. There was a wagon train of wounded and dead soldiers coming into New York City, and he went. Uh, William went from wagon to wagon searching for his father. So it, it's a, it's a, you could just, you could just feel that fear in him coming out through the journal and uh, he didn't find his father. So fortunately, um, and um, um, his, his father did survive this without any further wounds, but William reports in his journal that only 17 of his father's company uh, uh, mustered for duty the next day, whether that's right or wrong or memory or not. It, it, we do know that the 26th Regiment lost officers and men uh, disproportionately in that battle. So it's probably right. There was a lot of uh, uh, a, a, a lot of d uh, damage done to that unit. So um, it went went back to New York, uh, stayed in New York for a while, but then uh, Sir William Howe decides to uh, attack Philadelphia, and so uh, his father is sent to Philadelphia uh, via ship, 
uh, William goes with them, his family. It's amazing to think about it, but uh, they went on this ship together and uh, they, uh, his job was to um, clear the river forts uh, 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 and to open up passage for the river to get to Philadelphia. And so uh, William uh, recounts stories of ships running aground, uh, uh, different attacks, watching the, uh, uh, the British attack these forts. And finally, the British were able to um, uh, uh, secure the, 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 the access, the river access to Philadelphia. And um, William and his sister and mother, uh, they spend the winter of 1777-1778 uh, in Philadelphia. Um, and again, the, the, they, they were, quote, snug in, you know, in their, uh, uh, in Philadelphia, quote, you know, compared to Valley Forge but they also suffered from lack of food uh, back then. So this, you know, th this was never that easy uh, on these uh, on these families. Um, uh, families back then received half rations of the soldiers and, and uh, for the wives and quarter rations for the children. So um, uh, they probably had to figure out how to supplement their, their uh, rations somehow. Uh, and one of the funny things that uh, William puts in his, uh, uh, in his journal is that uh, he uh, talks about the Missiana Anz Anza, I guess, um, that uh, that's the famous party that, uh, that the officers uh, gave for General Howe on his um, return, uh, on his um, return, um, his going away party to return back to uh, England. And so he talks about how the, the drama and pageantry of that. Whether he he personally witnessed all that or he heard it, you know, you don't really know. And possibly his father was a page or knight in that because they a lot of people um, um, a lot of people assume those roles. A lot of soldiers assume those roles, but uh, it, it is a fascinating to hear his account of that. Um, so um, after that, um, when uh, Sir Henry Clinton takes over uh, command from Howe um, and uh, marches across. Uh, New Jersey. Uh, John Hunter goes with him, the 26th Regiment of Foot goes with him. And then um, William and his mother sail uh, on ships back to, to New York. Um, and uh, his father takes, um, uh, does um, uh, participate in the Battle of Monmouth. Um, not, a, he was, he wasn't in the thick of the fighting but uh, he describes um, the um, uh, intense heat and the heat prostration of various soldiers. Um, and so it clearly wasn't a very pleasant uh, experience. Um, uh, so anyway, so by that time that uh, the um, uh, summer of 1778 and into the fall, um, it, uh, it became clear that uh, John Hunter's uh, uh, war fighting days were coming to an end. Uh, William in his journal says that uh, the British authorities let him go to uh, come go back to Britain to collect a debt from an officer that went back before him. I couldn't find that officer, so I don't know. Uh, and it's possibly it could be in a different regiment. It's possible. It's also very possible that he was worn out uh, and just wasn't really capable of fighting wars anymore, uh, especially 18th century wars where you're marching with your feet. So, um, and there's some evidence in the diary, his father um, uh, had some infirmities uh, here, longer term infirmities. So, uh, so they got on a ship, they were part of a big convoy. There was a, usually a, a fall convoy that went back and forth to repatriate troops and bring new ones to um, New York. And um, he was on the ship, um, they got into a big storm and he got separated, the ship got separated uh, from um, the rest of the fleet. So they ended up going into the English Channel by themselves. And uh, lo and behold, a French privateer appeared, started bombarding the ships. And uh, William describes in his journal, that combat, including seeing people with some egregious, really egregious, you know, uh, losing limbs from cannonballs kind of wounds. So uh, again, another set of uh, unbelievable experiences for such a young child. Uh, the French privateer ends up um, capturing the ship and taking the crew and uh, to La Havre, France. And uh, so another 
round of captivity for the uh, so twice captured uh and uh, so he spent uh, time in uh, in a POW camp uh another interesting story from from that POW experience I remember his mother got some experience at um treating burns by treating the husband for the burns that he received at um, um St. John's and what what uh, what happened there was a local nobleman their child got scalded and um Mary's uh, and uh, Margaret um uh, Williams uh, mother went to her aid and helped that child recover and as a result this nobleman um uh, invited her to a uh, uh, dinner party with uh, uh, Lafayette so his, he his mother actually met Lafayette and uh, I tried to corroborate that I can tell you that uh, Lafayette attended several different dinner parties many with English soldiers so uh, it's probably it's probably true um uh, so he spent a year there another year there in in France he learned a little French uh and that which he did learn in Montreal uh, but uh and uh, that French will come in handy later in his life. But his father was exchanged after, after a year and returned to England. Uh, upon uh, landing, his father was uh, ordered to report to the colonel of the regiment uh, who lived in London. So um, William got a you know three or four week uh, London, all paid visit to London as a young boy. Um, but by this time, he was a, uh, uh, a teenager, and so it was time for him to learn a, a his own way. Um, and so uh, his father and mother kind of fought over this. Uh, his father wanted him to go in the army. I think William didn't want to go to the army because he'd seen so much death and destruction. He was just done with it. And later in life, he doesn't uh, he he uh, uh, does not fight in some places where he could have fought. And I think it's because of his experiences here. But his mother wanted him to become a printer. And so he apprenticed as a printer and uh, worked for several different uh, printing concerns. He learned how to typeset. He learned how to copy set. He learned how to uh, run the printing press. And, um, and he became rather bookish uh, here. And he uh, uh, went to um, lectures by Dr. Joseph Priestley. People may know him as the inventor of, uh, of oxygen or discoverer of oxygen and the inventor of uh, club soda and, um, and sparkling water. And uh, he, uh, uh, so he became a, a pretty uh, good sized student of, of, um, of um, Priestley. And uh, Priestley was um, uh, a religious person. Uh, he was a, a, what they call a dissenter. So he didn't, he dissented from the Church of England um, and um, because of that, he was persecuted for not only his religious beliefs, but his scientific beliefs um, and his uh, beliefs on um, uh, political beliefs. And so they, uh, uh, mobs actually ransacked Priestley's house. And this had a huge impact on William. And he said, uh, you know, I, I just I want to go to a place that um, will respect my ability to have different beliefs and that will allow me to have free speech. Um, so he decides to emigrate to the United States and he goes through another sea voyage. The sea voyage is again, there's a lot of issues. They run out of food. They uh, have some uh, uh, real missteps, but he does make it safely back to Philadelphia right after the 1793 yellow death fever epidemic. Um, and then at that point, the journal stops. So I had to recreate from archives and other records, public records, the rest of his life. Uh, so the, it, the journal stops at he's age 25 and William lives to 86. So I had to recreate his life from other documents. Um, I found that William was, uh, he married, he married a woman by the name of Ann Morrison from Bedford, Pennsylvania. Uh, they raised five children. But unfortunately, tragedy fought, uh, um, fought, found him again, where two of his children died in childbirth, or not in childbirth, as infants, and only one of his children outlived him. So he saw a lot of tragedy in his, his life. Um, as a printer, though, in the United States, um, he, he um, quickly moved from, from uh, 
Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, where there was a lot of competition to the Western part of the state where there's a lot of less competition. And so he founded the second newspaper west of the Alleghenies in Pennsylvania. And that's this first one, the Western Telegraph and Washington Advertiser. Um, it's a newspaper uh, that's covered southwestern part of uh, Pennsylvania. It was located on the main route west into the Ohio and Kentucky country. And so it was a good place uh, to, to start a newspaper. Um, but seeing all these people going west and hearing the stories, William decided to do the same thing. So he moved to Washington, Kentucky and started the Mirror newspaper. And then he became more interested in politics uh, and then moved to the Kentucky capital uh, in uh, uh, Frankfurt and started the Palladium. And uh, that's where he, that was the paper that really uh, uh, got, got him going as a, uh, a respected member of the community. Um, he, uh, um, in, in Frankfurt, he became a leading citizen in the town. Uh, besides running the newspapers, uh, he became an entrepreneur. He, uh, uh, ran manufacturing um, uh, companies that uh, took uh, hemp and turned it into rope, took, took hemp and turned it into cotton bagging to, to hold uh, cotton bales uh, and other hemp and products. Uh, he did that. He, he uh, uh, was on school board. He, he started schools. He uh, uh, waterworks and dams and most any community project building the he was he built the second capital or was part of the process of building the uh, that that organized the building the second capital um, and then he became a, a politician and um, he uh, became very politically uh, uh, interested he was elected to the um, Kentucky legislature served in the Kentucky legislature um, and then he became very very connected to Andrew Jackson who visited. Um, um, Frankfurt, and began an ardent supporter of Jackson. Um, and in 1828, when Jackson um, won the presidency, um, they actually, uh, in that campaign, William Hunter actually started a fourth paper just, just to support the Jackson candidacy, and it was called the Gazette. And, um, you know, uh, and when Jackson was elected, um, Jackson actually uh, um, uh, rewarded the newspaper editors around the country with jobs in Washington. William was one of those people, and Andrew Jackson brought him to Washington uh, to root out construction, uh, root to root out um, corruption uh, in the Navy. Uh, he worked in the Treasury Department, uh, five blocks from the White House today, uh, and um, I mean, a couple of blocks from the White House today, and he. Um, um, and he did a really good job. Uh, there's interesting stories in the book about the, the different kind of corruption that they uh, uncovered. But uh, Jackson liked it because it created him a lot of, of, of political capital. Um, and so he lived the rest of his life in, in Washington. Uh, so, you know, just, and he is uh, buried in the Congressional Cemetery. Um, uh, this is uh, the obelisk here is on the right hand side. Um, it's a story about this obelisk. Um, it didn't get there until about uh, about uh, 12 years after his death. And it's an he it, this got there is because when his wife Anne passed away, she um, uh, stipulated to the heirs, if you want my assets, you have to build the statue. You have to build this obelisk. And so um, the heirs did build this. And so I, I it, and I believe that they had a very, very happy marriage. And uh, I believe that Anne worked in the uh, businesses and was a, a, a partner of Williams. It's just that her name isn't in the historical record as much as, as Williams. I mean, you almost can't do what he did without her help. I mean, it's just impossible to, to, to do that. And she, so she had this statue built for him and that little gray stone on the left-hand side, that little slab on the ground, that's her burial marker. And uh, so she didn't build that anything. She wanted to honor him. So I think they had a very happy, a very happy marriage. Um, he, uh, he, he served eight presidents in Washington, if you can believe that. And, um, uh, and uh, he also, I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, he was the first newspaper editor to write an editorial uh, defying the Alien and Sedition Acts, and he was almost 
um, uh, prosecuted by the Adams administration. Uh, but uh, uh, they decided to go after Matthew Lyons instead, who was more famous. Uh, uh, so they did that. But uh, it, it, that is mentioned in his obituaries. So this had a big impact on his leg legacies. So he's written a one-of-a-kind journal. I'm really excited about being able to, to interpret it and share it with you here. You know, it's a story of an immigrant. You know, it's an immigrant story. Came to the United States, seeking democracy, seeking a Republican form of government. You know, it's 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 that was his views. Um, he because of that, he he did understand the importance of taking ethical and moral views. I mean, he fought for free speech throughout his life. Um, he, he took some stands on slavery and some other things that were against the community norms. Uh, so uh, it's 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 a, a wonderful legacy from that standpoint. It also shows that uh, the media business is um, very partisan but also very risky. So he was in and out of newspapers and in and out of business. And it just shows you that some things don't change. Uh, so it was partisan back then, it's partisan today. Uh, so anyway, it's a great story of embracing adventure, uh, overcoming adversity and taking prudent risks. So his story has captivated me and I hope it captivates you. And um, with that, you know, I'm glad to answer any questions, Mark. Yeah, no, this is a uh, this is absolutely fascinating. Great, glad you got that information up there. Yeah, if you want to check it out, because yeah, I, I think that that postscript they're talking about the the free speech aspect. Uh, you know, it's right there in the title talking about finding free speech, and I think that's uh, pretty amazing. And uh, I mean, w talking about this uh, this journal and being able to for him to write down what it was like throughout all those years and give perspective on, you know, I mean, he's in Philadelphia, he's in New York, he's on the frontier, he's uh, in London. I mean, like, that's just a remarkable, uh, remarkable story. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, and, and if folks who are watching, if you all, if anybody has any questions for Gene, feel free to drop it in the chat and, and we can ask him. Uh, you know, I, I think it's fascinating too that, you know, his father was, was Irish too. Um, uh, you know, that's often overlooked is the fact that, um, you know, that the, many of the Irish were, were fighting in the, in the British ranks, uh, uh during this, uh, there's many in the American ranks, but also in the British. Um, and then this whole idea of the, the women and children being with the, the soldiers is I think often overlooked. And this is, uh, uh, pretty interesting. You can get this kind of uh, young person's viewpoint of all of these different things. Uh, it, when you when you came across this and started researching this, did you see? I mean, is there much in you know having researched revolution a lot? I haven't seen much from that perspective uh, in firsthand account uh, type things. Um, it, when you're when you're researching this, did you find any other uh, children's viewpoints of the revolution uh, from that time period? You know, Mark, I, I looked here. I, I believe that this is the only surviving diary or journal written by a, a, a child of a British soldier. Uh, I've not been able to find any others. There, there, there are some American ones of about um, American uh, soldiers, but not 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 British. This is the only one I could I could find. So it is a kind of a one of a kind um, uh, a journal. It's an interesting um, window into what it would be like to be a, a British soldier. Yeah, no, and 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 that journal too is that today uh, is is that still the family still owns that or um, yes what's the status of that yeah they still own it um you know I um ha we have made it available to researchers um that that have asked to get available and it's uh, uh several researchers have have looked at it and 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 used it um I think the um it's um <laughs> it's a big family and so they're trying to figure out what to do with it I think there's some um. My guess is someday it'll end up in a, a uh, in a research institution someplace um, or museum someplace. But uh, you know, they, it, like anything else, they want to do these things with everybody's support, which makes a lot of sense. You know, um, I, th I bet you they're grateful that you're able to kind of bring your historian perspective and be able to interpret it through through this book uh, to kind of uh, shed the light on how significant this is. So. Yeah, well, they were very. The family was really excited to learn the the, the genealogy and the, and the name of the person because they didn't know how it fit into their family. So they were very excited to learn that and able to trace the genealogy, you know, back and forth. So that became a big deal for them. 
Yeah, um, and, and the fact that you know William goes on to become so prominent, I think that's a uh, that's pretty amazing. That not only does he have this amazing backstory, but I mean, he, his his own life story is its own its own story as well. So, yeah, it, uh, it's 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 interesting. Now, he, even his wife. Uh, I didn't say as much about her, but uh, believe it, she lived through the first part of the Civil War, and uh, she uh, she act. I was actually in the U.S. archives. There's a signed pass by Abraham Lincoln that allows um, Anne Hunter to pass through Confederate lines to Union lines, uh, and it's signed. And in typical Abraham Lincoln, um, uh, Anne Hunter is. Um, uh, traveling with her daughter and Abe says um, um, President Lincoln says um, the old one can pass but not the young one <laughs> 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 typical uh, Abraham Lincoln <laughs> well and it's interesting uh, you know that he is the, the the son of a British soldier and then ends up emigrating to the United States was it do we know if his was his father still alive when he emigrates to the United States and no he, his father passed away in, in uh, sometime shortly after August of uh, 1783 that's when he received uh, the pension mm -hmm. and uh, again this is a, a kind of a tough tragedy for him um his his father uh, passed sometime in that time frame I don't we don't I don't have a death time and so the pension stops right so the pension is only for the soldier not for the soldier's family so the mother and daughter actually go to Liz Lisbon uh Portugal Lisbon Portugal so that's that's that was always a uh, something I had to really <laughs> yeah. figure out and um William never sees his 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 um his mother and sister again and he describes himself as an orphan, uh, of not having a father and mother. Uh, I have uh, letters that he wrote to the American Council in Lisbon to try to inquire about his mother and with no response, no mm -hmm. response, at least that's been, um, uh, is that extant. So uh, I think he had a lot of sadness in his family too. You know, his family history was kind of tough, a lot of premature death, a lot of destruction, you know, and so, he was not able to stay with his mother and uh, throughout his life. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, a lot of those stories you're talking about, just the, the death and devastation. I mean, you know, you, and, and, you know, I, I've read about it sometimes, yeah, for, from, from, from the, the wealthier folks. Uh, so this is kind of like an interesting, like a middle class experience, but everybody's experienced that same kind of, uh, whether it's children, be, being lost or and then yeah the the death and devastation of warfare um uh a question uh you know if he's he, he's the son of a british soldier and then he rises to prominence in america does that ever come up uh do you know if people use that as a well he was on the wrong side uh, in that past war type thing uh yes it does and it comes up in a big way um he, uh the war of 1812 right so the war of 1812 he's in frankfurt kentucky kentucky is settled by many many i mean uh uh, uh veterans of the um, uh, uh of the american revolution and they get land grants and so kentucky is full of of veterans and so he's living in that environment i think for a while he tried to minimize people's knowledge of his background but they did know uh his background it's pretty hard to keep all that quiet and uh at the beginning of the war of 1812 um he was 44 years old and he was a major in the in the uh, Kentucky militia um uh the way it kind of worked there people volunteered to go to from the militia into volunteers to fight in the war of 1812 at that time he uh chose not to and he actually ends up resigning his his um um his commission uh 45 is the end date anyway but uh um when he i mentioned he was a politician and when he ran for office people accused him of cowardice for not fighting and disloyalty i don't believe any anything he was disloyal in any way if you look at that if you know he's working for the government anyway i i believe that I don't think he wanted to fight the British. I also really don't think he, I, I think he was uh, almost like a pacifist in that regard. He's, he's, you know, he saw the horrors of war 
upfront and close and personal. Um, so I, I, I can imagine why he didn't volunteer, you know, whether he would have, if he was forced to go or not, what he would have, I don't, who knows, that's unanswerable right now, but he certainly wasn't going to volunteer. Wow. Interesting. And, yeah. and, well, sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm just one other thing is, and it's kind of odd to think about a British person being persecuted, you know, for their, you know, for their background as being British, but he was. He definitely was. I mean, uh, there are several instances of people, you know, uh, uh, besmirching his reputation because um, he he was British by uh, and was son of a British soldier. So it it did kind of work against him in in many times. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, th I think it must be interesting, especially if he's so proud of his father's service, which obviously he he saw a lot of action um, and you know witnessed it firsthand, being a uh, being on on campaign with them. Uh, and then, and then, sure, yeah, in the in a United States after the war, you know, all the the, the Continentals and Americans or Patriots are kind of viewed as as the great heroes of the war, and uh, right. um, you know, it must have been just difficult uh, uh, perspective to have. So, um, well, great, that's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, any any folks that want to read more about, well, you know, I'm glad he's you know buried in Congressional Cemetery in Washington D.C. My wife actually worked at that cemetery for eight years. Uh, ah. I didn't know this whole story right there. They they do a uh, uh, annual Halloween event where they have reenactors yes. portraying ghosts in the cemetery uh, to tell some of these, you know, they got 60,000 stories in that cemetery, uh, but, uh, you know, I'll have to tell the folks working down there that they should uh, have William Hunter represented uh, next time <laughs> they yeah. can tell this story because this, uh, this is pretty fascinating. So, uh, but yeah, if you want to read more about this, yeah, check it out. William Hunter, Finding Free Speech, a bird. British soldier's son who became an early American by Gene Crock. Now you can get it on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Uh, thank you, Gene, for joining us this evening. Uh, folks, if uh, in two weeks, we're going to be back. Uh, Rob Orson's going to be uh, having our friend Bert Dunkerley on. We're going to be talking about the Battle of Utah Springs. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're going to start sh uh, focusing a lot of our, our, our revelries over the next uh, few months on the Southern campaign of the revolution. Um, okay. We do have a couple books uh, in the pipeline about to come out. Uh, mine on Charleston, uh, Rob Orson and Mark Wilcox have one on the Battle of Camden coming out as well. Um, and we're going to be doing our annual bus tour this year uh, down in Charleston. Uh, it's going to include a stop at Utah Springs. Um, so uh, be sure to check in uh, in a couple weeks uh, and get your tickets for the bus tour. You can find all that on our website, emergingrevolutionarywar.org. Uh, but thank you, Gene. Thanks for coming on tonight. Fascinating story. And uh, uh, we'll see you all later. Good. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I very much appreciate the opportunity. No problem.